Good evening and welcome to the Scottish Parliament. I'm Susan Murray, Director of the David Hume Institute, and I'd like to welcome you all to the 2022 Festival of Politics. This year's event celebrates the festival's 18th year of thought-provoking, inspiring and informing people of all ages from every walk of life to engage in the three days of spirited debate. We're delighted that you're able to join us today to participate in the State of the Union panel and later I'll be inviting you all to get involved with some questions. If you're keen to continue to throw your thoughts out there, please do so on Twitter with the hashtag FOP2022. And I'm very pleased to be joined by our panellists. Now, just before I introduce them, they've asked me to do one thing. Um, now, we know from the audience we've got quite a few people from Scotland, just because between the four of us we recognise some people in the room. <laughs> but we'd like to know if... Um, if you've ever been to Tattoo, what they do is get people to say hello from wherever they are in the world. And, and we think we've got quite a, quite a spread of people involved. So I can either do this by shouting out countries and you put your hands up, or um, you could just uh, randomly say names of countries and we'll see if we can hear them. So what, what works for you? If I, if I say, is there anyone here from England? Any hands up? Oh, anyone here from, from Wales? Anyone from Northern Ireland? You. Anyone from the Republic of Ireland? And anyone from France? Germany? Spain? Uh, anywhere else in Europe I've not mentioned? Italy. Italy, I'm sorry, Anne, Italy. Um, and then anyone from America? And then, uh, is it really bad to just say rest of the world? Um, <laughs> rest of the world, just uh, shout out the country you're from if there's anyone here from... Right, so mainly European audience. That's quite really useful for us to know. Um, New Zealand. Ah, oh, thank you. <laughs> you know, if I had a prize, I'd be presenting it to you for coming all the way from New Zealand for today. Thank you very much for coming. You are very welcome to the Scottish Parliament. Um, so now, uh, now we've had a bit of fun, um, it's useful for the panellists to know that, but I'd like to introduce you to Michael Keaton. Michael is Emeritus Professor of Politics at the University of Aberdeen. He was founding director of the Centre for Constitutional Change and he's taught at several universities including Strathclyde, Western Ontario, Ontario, the European University Institute and is a fellow of the British Academy, the Royal Society of Edinburgh and the Academy of Social Science and of the European Academy. Professor Keating is the author or editor of many books on Scottish politics, European politics, nationalism and region regionalism. Um, his most recent book is The State and Nation of it, sorry, State and Nation in the United Kingdom, The Fractured Union, and it's published by Oxford University Press in 2021. Um, Nicola is next on the panel. Nicola is Professor of Territorial Politics at the University of Edinburgh and Fellow of the Royal Society of Edinburgh. She is a Fellow and was founding co-director of the Centre for Constitutional Change and is based at the University of Edinburgh. And last but not least is Lisa. Uh, Dr Lisa Clare Whittam is a Research Fellow on the ESRC funded project Governance for a Place Between the multi-level dynamics of implementing the protocol on Northern Ireland and Ireland based at Queen's University Belfast. Cool. Please join me in welcoming them. <laughs> so now without further ado, um, Michael, you're going to kick us off by saying a few words. Would you like to set the scene for us? Thanks, Susan, and good evening. Uh, I, since this is a panel on the State of the Union, I just want to say a few words about what we mean by a union, the union, why unionists seem to no longer understand what the union is, and why the greatest threat to the union is post currently not by nationalists, but by unionists themselves. Now, let's take a few elements of understanding what we mean by the United Kingdom being a union. We mean that the United Kingdom is not a nation state in the way Denmark or Norway or somewhere might be a nation state. There's not a single nation, a single people, a single demos. It's a multinational or plurinational union of peoples. Now, most of you are from Scotland. This is absolutely banal, but explaining this to people out with Scotland can be quite difficult. It's not just that we've got <coughs> separate nations. We've got England, Scotland, Wales, uh, a bit of Ireland. But within those 
nations. There are different sensibilities. People in Scotland mostly feel Scottish, but some people feel British as well, and some people feel only British, and some people only Scottish. It's extremely complex. Lisa will be talking about Northern Ireland, where it gets more complex again. And the idea of being British, then, is very different across different parts of the Union. So when unionists talk about Britishness, or Theresa May say, the British people voted for Brexit, we say, what is that supposed to mean? There are multiple ways of being British. It's not a single thing. And unionists in recent years have said, yes, you can be Scottish and Welsh and all the rest of it, but the Britishness is common and it's the same everywhere. It's not the same everywhere. The diversity goes all the way down. A second element is about where we come from uh, as uh, a state or, or, or a union. It's about history and the future. It's about our historical trajectory. Are we agreed where we came from? Uh, I, I go around Europe talking about nationalism a lot, and the first place you get to is, is history. In fact, I came back to Scotland at the time of devolution, thinking as a political scientist I'd have a, a, a living to make out of this. Not at all. The people who are making the living were the historians. And they're the people who are always the public intellect. Do we share a view of the past? Well, Michael Gove, a Scotsman who is Minister of Education in England, said, all schools must teach us the story of our island nation. You don't teach that in Scotland or in Northern Ireland. History is contested. That's okay. That's just the way the world is. And as for the future, are we all agreed? Could we ever agree on the future? They talk about having a British Constitutional Convention. We'll all get together and find out where we agree on the future. We won't, because some people want an independent Scotland. Some people want the Union. People in Northern Ireland, some people want Irish unity, some want to stay with the UK, others want other kinds of formulas. You don't need to agree on the, the, the teleology, we call it, the purpose, the, the trajectory, to be in a union. This is like the European Union. We have very, very different visions of what it should be. The third element is about what we believe, about values or, or, or ethos. You hear a great deal about British values, and unionists are always talking about British values. And what are these British values? Democracy, fair play, the rule of law. Well, yes, we do share these values right across these islands, and most of Europe as well. They're not British values, they're universal values. So the notion that somehow these values tie the Union together is at least questionable. Now, these values are admirable. Uh, they're not actually challenged by nationalism or unionism. They will persist whatever happens to the Union. So it's odd to say somehow, uh, unless you're British, you don't believe in democracy and the rule of law or something. There's nothing whatever to do with these things. Uh, they come together. Yes, we all believe in these things. We can have a polity based upon them, a union based upon them, but don't tie them down to a particular concession of nationality. And the final thing is about sovereignty. And it's an abstract concept, but you hear a lot about it these days. And what was Brexit all about? Brexit was taking back the control, which means the British people, as uh, Mrs May said, or the British Parliament, whatever, would take back control and be completely sovereign and not be subject to any external authority or indeed any internal division of power. And since Brexit, Nicola, maybe we'll talk about this, we, we've had a lot of the reassertion of the Westminster Authority. Yes, you can have your devolution, but up to a limit. Uh, and when it comes to a conflict, we will always have the last word. And that's not a union. That's a unitary state. Maybe decentralized, but it's a unitary state. In a union, sovereignty is divided profoundly. The, the nations come together in different ways. They negotiate. They don't, you don't just get your own way by electing one government that holds all the cards. So the union then is multiple things. There are multiple fibers that make up the texture of the union. They're woven together in complex ways. And unionism has worked historically in the United Kingdom, apart from a spectacular failure in Ireland in the early 20th century. But otherwise, it's worked because it recognizes the complexity of these relationships, and it's not reduced to a single thing. Now, in my book, which you, you kindly mentioned, I, I have the analogy of the human body. But I started off with a metaphor of the ro fourth road bridge. And apologies to anybody here who's a civil engineer, but it's just a metaphor. So don't get it. <laughs> But a few years ago, there was an alarm in the press because they said the fourth road bridge is about to fall down because there are these cables and each consists of thousands of filaments woven together in complex ways. And they kept on breaking, ping, 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 ping all over the place. And people said, in a few months, this thing's going to fall down. And it was pointed out it will only fall down if all the filaments break in the same place at the same time. And that's not going to happen. It's weakening, of course. 
We may have to be careful what kind of traffic, but it's not just going to collapse. And the union is like that. It's like all these cables that are tied together in multiple different places. So if it fails one place, it'll be held together in other places. It's untidy, it's messy, that's how it works. But the danger to it will occur if unionists say, oh, there's only one filament or three or four filaments. Because if those break, then the union breaks. So it's all about British values and whatever Michael Gove thinks there are, and, and that, that is broken, uh, you lose the union. So the union is complex, it's organic, uh, even if Scotland goes its own way and Ireland unifies, things will remain, some of these strands will remain together. And if unionists realise this, which they used to do, then the union would be in a much better state than it is. Hence, as I say, it's not the nationalists that are threatening the union, it's the unionists themselves. Mm. Wow. <laughs> <clears throat> Thank you, Michael. Much food for thought there. Nicola, do you want to go next? Sure. Um, I think your, oops, your um, question was about this, the, the state of the union, and, 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 <laughs> and it's clearly not in um, a particularly healthy state, um, but nor is it necessarily doomed. I think there are particular pressures that have emerged over the last few years and the source of those I think is Brexit and there are different dimensions of Brexit um, that have generated these pressures. One in Scotland and Northern Ireland, I'm going to let Lisa talk about Northern Ireland in particular, um, is the fact of Brexit, the fact that you had such a fundamental change to the UK's constitutional status, to its relationship with the European Union with such a fragmentation of preferences across the different territories of the United Kingdom. So in the Scottish context, that makes it relatively easy to present the case that um, Scotland's voice, Scotland's preference as a nation, was not recognised within the United Kingdom in the context of Brexit, and that's quite clearly been the case. Um, the second element of Brexit is the process. So during the Brexit process, which is a lengthy progress, process, an ongoing process, Brexit is not done, um, the role of the devolved governments in that space was very minimal. The UK government of Mrs May and her successor, and doubtless his successor, was very much of the view that this was a matter for the UK government alone, um, and there were meetings that the devolved governments would be invited to, but they had no influence whatsoever on the Brexit process, the Brexit negotiations, their preferences may be articulated, but they had no influence at all. And there was something of a marginalisation um, of the devolved governments in that process. Um, the third element is that Brexit has had implications for the UK's own system of domestic governance and has had um, challenges, certainly, uh, for devolution. Um, they're quite complex, the most controversial of which is um, a piece of legislation called the United Kingdom Internal Market Act. Um, I won't go into the main details of it, but um, an element of it, at least, changes the way, potentially changes the way that devolution functions and potentially changes the reach of laws passed in the Scottish Parliament and in the other um, legislatures across the UK. Um, and that undermines the authority of the devolved institutions. And it does so because political autonomy, self-government, if you like, has been um, placed in a sort of beneath the value of, of free movement, of free movement for business, of, of, of the removing barriers to trade and mobility um, within the UK. And that was a political judgment uh, that the Conservative government made. But it has created um, challenges for devolution and it was um, a piece of legislation that was affecting devolution in quite fundamental ways, but passed without the consent of any of the devolved uh, legislatures and indeed in the face of their stiff opposition. So I think those are the three elements of Brexit that have um, created pressures on the union. The other element, and this is also in part linked to that same controversial piece of legislation, is that the UK government has developed a much more competitive 
approach to devolution. Its way of strengthening the union appears to be to challenge devolution, to, cha to challenge the devolved governments, and in particular, I think, to challenge a nationalist government. And we've seen that in the context of the Conservative leadership contest, um, com comments of the probable next Prime Minister to ignore the First Minister of Scotland is perhaps not conducive uh, to a healthy working relationship between the leaders of these islands. Uh, but that competitive approach um, is linked to nation building, and nation building's fine. Um, strengthening the union deliberately, having a strategy to try to strengthen the union is fine. But personally, I think you're more likely to do that if you embrace devolution as a part of it, rather than to fight and compete against it. And the final thing I would say, I uh, spent the last um, uh, few years looking at intergovernmental relations, which is the flip side of the powers, the lawmaking powers of the devolved legislatures. It's how they engage with the UK government and with each other, and how they manage the, the interdependence between uh, the, the different uh, powers. And intergovernmental relations in the UK is dire. It's, it, the trust between the administrations is really, really low. Now, they have negotiated new machinery. Well, see how that works but the problem in sense is is the culture that surrounds those relationships and the lack of trust between them michael used a body metaphor and a bridge um, metaphor um, the metaphor that i've been playing around with is of the family partly um, coming from the use uh, from politicians of the idea of the uk as a family a family of nations we've heard it again in the context of the leadership um, election. So I've been asking in um, interviews with officials about whether it feels like a family um, when uh, they are engaged. And there are some um, feelings of a sense of connection, a sense of um, connectedness between the administrations. Sometimes um, they're working towards a common purpose in COVID, for example. We certainly saw, saw that. Um, but a lot of pushback from the devolved governments, unless you think, well, if it's a family like Dallas or Dynasty, <laughs> that kind of family, maybe then it, then, then it works. Um, another official, I, I recall, I'll end on this, um, said, um, this was an official working in Scotland, said that in these intergovernmental meetings, sometimes he felt like the distant cousin that was at the family wedding who was there because he had had to be asked to be there, but was there on sufferance, and that's what it felt like to be in that room. But what all of that tells us is that it's not really a, a, a productive relationship or as productive a relationship as it could be. And as Michael said too, my own view is that whatever the constitutional relationships between these islands, even if in the context of Irish unity or independence, there will have to be relationships and ways of working together to manage some of the problems and challenges that are purely by virtue of sharing these islands. Thank you. Thank you, Nicola. So So much in both what Michael and Nicola have said, but I want to come on to our family in Northern Ireland there. <laughs> what, I'll, I'll let you uh, say a few, few words, but I'd quite like if you could input on what kind of family member you, you think that would be quite good to keep those analogies coming. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you so much and thank you for the invitation to be here. Um, it is one of the benefits of going after uh, both such rich introductions to be able to kind of spin off and if we're going to extend the analogy, I, I mean, Northern Ireland has to be the problem child, surely. <laughs> um, uh, and actually, I do think that links into um, some of what Michael was laying out in terms of an understanding of the union and the plurinational quality of the UK union. Um, I think quite often in, in history of the UK and um, the British state, Northern Ireland has been an exception, been treated as an exceptional place, but also in a sense has been something of an exception that kind of disproves or pulls at the rules or the, the norms, the understandings of what um, the place, the UK is. 
Um, and, and so the problem child, I do think, is fitting um, in some way because in that it accept, an exception that disproves the rules, it's like when you look at Northern Ireland, you can see, of course, it's not a unified nation. And of course, there are um, dominant narratives about the British state and how it came to be. They don't often sit well in the Northern Irish context. And therefore, it gets kind of set aside and set apart. But to what extent are you talking about the state if you're setting apart a whole region of it? And I do think there's something quite um, can be fruitful in bringing back Northern Ireland into the, the conversation because it helps us to talk about the diversity that's inherent across the UK. Um, Northern Ireland isn't quite as an exception. We all have problems of our own. We're maybe not the problem child, but <laughs> there's always been tensions and there's always been diversity. Um, so that's the first point I would make about Northern Ireland being something of an exception that disproves the rules. And if we look at the contemporary picture, um, the idea of the four nations of the UK in itself, I just think it's, it's useful to, to highlight how, how inaccurate a description that is for Northern Ireland, um, to discuss the UK as a, a state based of four nations. To call Northern Ireland a nation is to fundamentally misunderstand the place and to ignore its history, because it's a place defined by opposing nationalities, opposing identities, and conflicting visions for the constitutional future of the place. So I get that that doesn't roll off the tongue, <laughs> um, <laughs> and it doesn't fit well in a press briefing, but, but allowing the complexity of Northern Irish history into the story, back into the story, I do think is helpful to to start talking about um, broader issues of the diversity of the UK history and different understandings, the multiplicity of identities and the complexity in the post-Brexit world of dealing with um, the new uh, legislative functions that have returned from the EU, which brings me to my second point, and which is building more on what Nicola was saying around um, the post-Brexit context. Uh, I always remember back to Article 50, do you remember back in the day, 2017, um, Article 50 was the, the article in the EU treaties that was triggered the formal process of the UK's withdrawal. And that um, the relevant clause says um, any EU member state can decide to withdraw from the union, union in accordance, the European Union, in accordance with its own constitutional requirements. And I think that's it's just interesting because the UK constitution is uncodified, it's known for being unwritten. But what that meant was pre-Brexit, we could have different visions of what the constitution was and what it required sitting alongside each other without having to be defined or come into conflict. But almost as we've undergone this process, according to the UK's uncodified, unsettled constitutional requirements. We have withdrawn, done a process that no other member state had done before. There's been a forced um, looking at those requirements and the, the ambiguities that were there have had to be dealt with. And this is where the UK Internal Market Act comes in and the, um, the tensions, political tensions that existed pre-Brexit were given a new um, level of importance and immediacy. Uh, and I do think that's part of the, the reason why to describe the state of the UK's union, I mean, it's ailing. It's not terminal, but it's, it's in a serious condition at the minute. Um, and then so if we have the, the process of Brexit has kind of exposed constitutional fault lines and tensions within the UK state, Northern Ireland is the part of the UK as an exceptional place that's had the most contested constitutional history, the most exceptional constitutional history. It also has um, an exceptional land border with an EU member state. So, um, and this, I'll try to finish on this because if I start down the path of Brexit in Northern Ireland, you'll have to shut me up. Um, but the, uh, I think one of the key changes 
um, in the post-Brexit context when we're discussing the nature of the UK state and the UK Union is that Northern Ireland can no longer be treated as an exceptional place and kind of set apart as periphery, although it has unique um, circumstances and unique government set up and the protocol in particular, um, which we may discuss further, um, recognises that. But the new UK-EU relationship um, and the process that we've got undergone means that Northern Ireland is now the touching point between the legal and regulatory order of the EU and the legal and regulatory order of the UK. Um, and that has, that has a big um, significance and the architecture of the post-Brexit UK-EU relationship um, under the Trade and Cooperation Agreement has, it sits over the top of that kind of hinge centre of the Venn diagram context, which is all to say that when you then come back down to the constitutional tensions within Northern Ireland, the fact it's not a nation, it's defined by opposing constitutional identities and visions and aspirations, the, the whole UK-EU relationship context now has at, at its centre a place that is fundamentally quite fragile. And until we start to, we, until um, those involved, the UK in particular, the UK government and the EU, really start to, um, I would suggest, change that approach to away from the competitiveness and, and perhaps aggression that makes sense if you're looking between the UK and the EU, but is not appropriate for dealing with a still dealing with its post-conflict, still processing its peace, fragile place that has always been complex and exceptional and now sits at the centre of two very big players in international relations. I told you I could keep talking forever <laughs> on that one, so I'll, I'll stop there. <laughs> Thanks, Lisa. Thank you. Uh, I can see um, both Michael and Nicola have scribbled badly in a couple of things you said, but um, I'm interested, I, I quite think in pictures in my head, so taking Michael's bridge and your word ailing, I'm kind of thinking, if we think of the old fourth bridge and the, the cables, and then the number of things coming down, you mentioned the Internal Markets Act, is that just one of the fibres on the bridge? Is the cost of living crisis another fibre? Are we at a point where if you take an ailing state and you treat with aggression, perhaps putting too many cars over the bridge, are, are we pushing the union too far with the aggression and competitiveness you mentioned? Who wants to take that? <laughs> uh, well, 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 yes. Um, uh, and therefore you can model a scenario where the United Kingdom falls apart, but it won't fall apart neatly on the lines of the constituent nations. And it's just not just Northern Ireland, not a neat unit. Mm -hmm. Scotland isn't, because 51% of people in Scotland vote for independence, 49% will vote against. And what does independence mean anyway? Nicholas' point here, if we're still going to keep the Queen and possibly the pound and an open border, uh, there's, no, there's, no, there's no neat solution to it. It's not like Norway uh, in the early 20th century where something like 99% of people voted to become independent and it's a clean break. This is a modern complex state. So it's easy to say, my argument is the Unionists have lost the argument, but the Nationalists have not won the argument by saying there's a clean, clean uh, neat alternative that could work either. Nicola? Yeah, I mean, it's interesting in the cost of living um, crisis. I mean, there's a couple of things. One is that it's not so long ago that the Scottish Parliament um, renewed its settlement in 2016 Scotland Act. Wales had a new settlement in 2017 as well, um, still less powerful than the Scottish Parliament. Um, those of you who were here might remember that that came um, after the, the last independence referendum when the parties all got together. Um, it took them six weeks to hammer out a deal um, and then legislation was uh, designed on the basis of that um, inter-party negotiation. And it led to um, quite a significant increase in the powers and responsibilities of the Scottish Parliament, especially over income tax. But at the same time, it exposed it to decisions 
over which it has no control. Um, and in some senses, the cost of living crisis is not a policy decision, although there are policy decisions related to it. Um, but these, this, these things will affect the responsibilities of um, the Scottish Parliament, but they don't necessarily have the fiscal tools and other policy tools to, to address them. So it's, it's the, the interdependence of the settlement still um, that is at issue. And I think there are um, some difficulties with the settlement that we have here, um, which is hardly surprising if you negotiate it in six weeks, um, that might need to be addressed um, at some point or that create challenges, I think, for any any Scottish government. Um, but at the same time, uh, the cost of living crisis isn't really an, a union issue. <laughs> it's not a constitutional issue. And it's a, it, it's a problem that would face any administration under any constitutional scenario. And we're not hearing yet, um, either from um, leader of the opposition in Westminster or from um, devolved leaders, um, a, a completely different way um, of responding to it, um, and I think maybe there are challenges for all of them. All of them there is, can be a bit tempting to sort of blame and say we we can't do it because the levers are elsewhere. But if you want to have an ambition of independence in particular, what would you do if you did have the levers? I would want to hear that and think you know where is the vision for doing something differently to chat to, to face that challenge and the other challenges that will be coming uh, down the road. I agree. Um, <laughs> I would also uh, say that I think there's a sense in which that architecture, um, the post-Brexit context, we haven't really seen how it works or doesn't work. Um, so the UK Internal Market Act um, sits alongside the Common Frameworks process that um, operates, Nicola and I have uh, talked about this at length, um, they kind of operate under two different logics of, and, and visions for the operation of um, the, the state and legislative development, UK Internal Market Act being um, quite a central, quite a very centralised vision um, where policy decisions made in Westminster uh, really shape um, what can be done elsewhere. The common frameworks process is different because it's um, at least in principle um, designed to facilitate agreements to disagree in how um, different policy areas are managed across the different jurisdictions um, of the UK. And there is a possibility of interaction of kind of trade-off between those two. Um, and we've seen the first example of that um, through the exception um, the exclusion, the exclusionary uh, process being agreed for the use of single-use plastics under the UK Internal Market Act. So um, Scotland and Wales and Northern Ireland can opt out of a decision in respect of single-use plastics um, to introduce a ban against certain single-use plastic products. Um, but that's them opting out of what otherwise would have been set under the UK Internal Market act logic if you follow and they're doing that through common frameworks which are provisions to agree to disagree i realize that's getting a bit niche um, but the the kind of point is this is the first example that we've had not all common frameworks have yet even been finalized or agreed um, and so that you have we're still really working out how this these the new systems work and how the political relationships are affected or facilitative of those different um, new processes. I would then also just want to flag that I think one of the tensions of the that you might see in the union that maybe is um, reaching far out to the edges of the bridge is what's happening outside of the UK context. So the prospect of divergence between in particular the UK market and the EU market because of the, the um, historic relationship there and the geographic proximity. So decisions made at an EU level in terms of change of policy, the extent to which they are or are not reflected at the UK level and what businesses think about that um, 
and who makes that decision, whether there's agreement or disagreement about that, all of that complexity, we haven't really started to see what that looks like and how that plays into the politics of the UK. Um, also, the development and the operation of trading agreements, we haven't really started to see that in a significant way and how they play down to the devolved level, but they will have imp impact there. Um, I would flag those. I could go on to a whole other set for Ireland, Northern Ireland, but perhaps we'll get on to that. Okay. I, I think we'll open it up to questions because I can tell there's a lot of questions in the room. So I'll take a, two at a time, if that's all right with the panel, um, and we'll try and get through as many as we can. There is a microphone coming around. Um, if you want to say your name, you're very welcome. If you want to stay anonymous, that's fine too. Um, and um, put up your hands nice and uh, uh, sharply so the person with the microphone can see. Um, who wants to start us off? The gentleman here in the yellow trousers. And if there's a second one as well, can we have that too? No, second one. Okay. Um, hit some of the question then, please, sir. Uh, yeah. Hi, I'm David. I'm, yeah, I'm French. We would hear that with my accent. And I have a problem when you speak about like a family of nations. Um, I just find like the term not like quite accurate. Like if I think about like a family, and like in a family, like each person has a voice. When like in uh, the UK, basically it's dominated by one nation, like with the most, the biggest population. And for me, what I don't really understand, like the UK as a modern union is like, it's not one voice per nation, but the complexity is like England because of his population with always decide for the other nations. And I, I think the main problem of the state of the UK Union at the moment is that. It's like, if I'm Scottish, Welsh, or from Northern Ireland, I don't see how I have a voice and an impact uh, on the UK policy. Because if we take Scotland, like even if Scotland votes 100% for one party, it will never change the UK decision on any matter. And I, my question is like, how do you see that in the future? Like, should we change the constitution that we need a majority of the nations deciding on the policies of the UK? Or maybe we need to change the voting systems? Like, how uh, do you see like in the future how we can change this thing like that if I'm Scottish or Welsh, I don't feel just dominated by England, not as a powerful nation, but just because the population is way different and makes sense that England will always have the last word. Thank you. And there's a second question to the man in the glasses there. Thank you. Um, hi, Adam Locke. Um, and despite the accent, which is obviously very painfully English, um, Scotland is my country, Scotland is my home, it's where I plan to stay, which informs the question because it could sound um, slightly dodgy without that context. Um, but it's a fantastic book by a journalist called Gavin Esler in which he raises the question that unaddressed English nationalism is a core issue um, for the union, union survival. Uh, he uses a whole range of examples. So, for example, Jacob Rees Mogg referring to Shakespeare as a British icon, when, of course, Shakespeare predates Britain. Um, and in a more modern example, you can sort of um, look at Culture Minister Nadine Doris saying, we haven't had an event like the Birmingham Commonwealth, Ga uh, Birmingham Commonwealth Games since the Olympics, when, of course, Glasgow held the Commonwealth Games um, after the Olympics. Um, there's a question here in which the idea of England and Britain culturally and politically are conflated by UK ministers. And so I suppose it's partially a two, well, it's largely a two-point question. The first one is, would you agree with that point, that unaddressed English nationalism, wherein there is no English parliament, there is no English voice, there is no recognised English entity separate from the UK parliament? To what extent is that a threat to the union? And secondly, if you do agree or disagree with that statement, um, how would you remedy that? And what do you think could be a solution to that to ensure that the UK, if it should carry on, um, does genuinely represent all four nations without this unaddressed English question um, taking over the issues of the Union to a detriment of the English and the Scottish, Welsh, and in some ways, most particularly the Northern Irish. Thank you. Wow. Two, two great questions to get us started with. They're not controversial ones at all. Um, <laughs> <laughs> who, who wants to uh, start us off discussing those? 
Åh, oh, for god. Jeg kunne ikke glemme det. Jeg mener, at tying dem både together, I think. I mean, I think one thing I would want to say is that England is itself very diverse. Um, and so I'm always sort of slightly concerned with sort of talking about England as if it is you know, a, a single entity, because I'm sure there are many people in different parts of England that feel dominated by decisions made elsewhere. Um, there is a problem of English, English governance. England is perhaps the most centralised nation in Europe, certainly in, in the Western Europe, um, and that's a problem. Um, and it's not a problem with an easy answer. Um, certainly, some of my colleagues have been looking at English attitudes for quite a long time, and what, they, what comes across clearly from their data as well, that there isn't a clear consensus on how England should be governed, it's definitely not regionalism. It, what comes across is people wanting an England-wide solution, whether that's a parliament or something else um, as, as part of that. But I do think govern the issue of English governance is part of, and has to be part of, finding um, new ways to govern the, the union. But you're never going to get away from the fact that England is the dominant in population terms part of these islands. It's just a fact. Um, and it, I think it does limit how far you can go in creating federal type solutions that may be seen um, as helping to address what might be a democratic deficit in Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland, but at the same time generating perceptions of injustice or a democratic deficit within the largest nation if it seemed to be giving too much power to relatively small, in population terms, territories of the United Kingdom. But federal countries do this. And look at any federation, you will see states or provinces or whatever they're called of very different sizes, in California and Maine, let's say. Um, and there's an exception within a federal, uh, an, sorry, an acceptance within a fed federation that that's part of the deal. It's part of the way that you hold something together. We don't have that federal mindset in the UK. It's federalism is seen as a, a nasty word in certain political uh, circles, um, and it's not something that would could be combined with parliamentary sovereignty, which for some reason even though it's only a convention, seems to have been given the sort of massive status um, within the UK's constitution. So there will be proposals coming forward, things like um, replacing the House of Lords with a, a chamber of the nations and regions. Um, that's probably quite a good thing. I don't think it's going to resolve anything at all. Um, but unless you're willing to go down the road of fundamentally restructuring, at the United Kingdom, then I think these problems are ones that we have to learn to live with. Um, and that involves compromises um, in different, in, in each of the parts of the United Kingdom, and in particular within the central institutions of power. And I think Whitehall has not really adapted to devolution. It's not really adapted to the UK as a multi-level complex political system. And I think therein lies many of the problems. Yeah. Can I just ask before, Israel, the, you mentioned attitude to federalism. Has that stayed consistent over time? Sorry. So you said um, English attitudes to federalism have been the same. No, it, not English attitudes to the, the way that England is governed. So what, correct me if I'm wrong, Michael, but what seems to have been emerging from the data is that there is more of an awareness of England as England. So that sort of historical thing of England and Britain just being conflated, yes, we might hear that sometimes in political discourse, but actually there is increasing awareness of England as a distinctive nation within the United Kingdom and a, a sense of dissatisfaction uh, with the way that England is governed, and that appears to have motivated quite a bit of the Brexit vote 
um, within, within England. And there's an irony that comes out of it too, is that those in England who define themselves as British look more like, in terms of their attitudes and values, those who in Scotland and Wales define themselves as Scottish and Welsh. So. Okay, fascinating. Michael. Uh, yeah, I can just take up from, from that point directly. It's true that in the past there was a certain tendency of people in England to think they lived in a unitary state called England or Britain, and it doesn't matter which you use because they're the same thing, infuriating to people outside England. But actually that was one of the things that made the union work, because if they want to have their idea of the union and we want to have a different one, it, it, it worked. Of course, it, it was highly problematic because of the pressures in Scotland and then in Wales to uh, gain more self-government, at least with, with, within the Union, which went on for 100 years. Uh, Northern Ireland is always then exceptional. These point is absolutely right. Well, and anything, that, by the time you're talking about the UK, you can't leave Northern Ireland out. Uh, if you're going to call it Great Britain, then that's a different thing altogether. So let's get the terminology right. But now it, it doesn't do to say England stroke Britain because there is this English consciousness. There is an English question. We just don't know what the question is. It's not the answer we're looking for, it's the question we're looking for. And then we can think about the answer because there are multiple things there. And our colleague John Denham, who's working with us on a project, former uh, minister, is very articulate about this. He said, yes, it's not, it's not an English parliament, it's not devolution, it's not something that would match Scotland and Wales, but there is some kind of democratic deficit there that people have identified. And a voice for England needs to be found. And then we've been through the whole gamut of things because there Regionalisation, I'm old enough to remember regionalisation in the 60s and then when it went away again, uh, it was brought back under John Prescott, it didn't work because of a referendum in the northeast of England. And then after that, in the 70s, they went for metropolitan governments, Margaret Thatcher abolished them, they've just been reinvented all over again. <laughs> uh, there's constant churn of institutions because they can't seem to get it right. One is that the departments in London just can't give way, they just can't give up control. Uh, and, uh, and, and another is that there's no institutional fix to any of these things. These are deeper discontents. Another thing that's been coming up is the massive regional inequality in England. We talk about the United Kingdom having the biggest spatial disparities in Europe, while well, England as a unit has uh, the biggest spatial disparities as well. And that's giving rise to a huge amount of discontent. And then if we're looking at institutions, the question is, are we looking at the government of England, in which case city regions or whatever might work, or England as a component part of the Union, which is a completely different story. And if it's England about how you govern England, that's their business. We, we, that's not our business, that's, that's their business to sort out. Uh, because we can't impose on them. We would not like them imposing on us. If it's England as a part of the Union, the implications that are so radical uh, that you just hardly think about it, because the English don't want federalism. They would rather, all the survey shows, they would rather Scotland became independent than go for a federal UK, which would restrict their ability to do things for England, because that would be part of a federal system. And then finally, on Brexit, uh, one indicator of English nationalism that's really strong, according to all the surveys, is the connection between feeling English and not British and supporting Brexit. So maybe Brexit will satisfy that English nationalism. Mm. Maybe that's an outlet for it. Uh, but Brexit seems to be a never-ending project now. It will never be over. It'll just be, go on forever and ever. And that's one of the things that is connected in an extraordinary way with the, the notion of being English. Mm. What a thought. On forever and ever. Lisa. <laughs> um, just to, yeah, I guess, build on that. Um, and it's perhaps quite a specific example, but um, uh, the British Irish Council um, is an interesting institution I think in this the context of this conversation around um, the organization of governance and really it gets to the point of the English or the UK government in order to really reimagine the relationship between constituent parts and the way power is held um, has to give up uh, what it has at present which is um, at times, um, perfect. so the British Irish Council was set up under the 1998 Belfast Good Friday Agreement that brought um, peace to Northern Ireland. It's part of the Strand Three. It's a three-stranded agreement that deals with the East-West relationship. 
and the British Irish Council includes representatives of Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland, the UK government, the Channel Islands and the Isle of Man. Um, and they come together uh, once or twice a year to discuss shared issues and cooperative approaches to problems. They can agree shared approaches in different settings, um, different kind of groupings within the context. But the point that I was going to make is that uh, the heads of government of all parties come together except the UK government, which is a Secretary of State, um, a kind of more junior um, representative that's there. But that's, they don't have, the Prime Minister doesn't have to be there. Um, and so in a sense, it's, the vision is there, uh, but it doesn't have teeth as an institution. Um, there isn't voting power, it is, it is for discussion and cooperation. But I think it's an interesting, the way that it operates, indicator of, of that problem um, that exists, notwithstanding the democratic deficit and the English question that, that also sits. That was the one thing I was gonna flag. The other thing is just, um, and this is perhaps something somewhat anecdotal, but I think there's a sense in which post-Brexit context the UK is learning what the UK is mm. in quite a real, quite a, quite a present way um, through discussions around the, uh, with officials around the implementation of the Northern Ireland Protocol, quite controversial, and the, the unique relationship that Northern Ireland now has to EU law. Um, there's been discussions back and forth between departments, central UK departments and devolved Northern Ireland departments, not knowing who specifically is responsible for implementing specific aspects of EU law and or UK law and its implementation because they haven't had to know before. <laughs> and, and so there's, there is a sense in which in some of the, um, the po politics of it and the big picture, it does come down to complexity and the inherent complexity of running a multi-leveled um, state. And yeah, so I was just gonna make that point. Sometimes it's actually about not knowing rather than a uh, power grab sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> um, next set of questions, who wants to go next? The gentleman here in the blue and oh, on two different sides. Have we got two microphones or just the one? Just the one. Just the one. So if we do that question and then we'll move straight over to the other side. Just a couple of things. Um, the, the, current, the, the two current Tories that are obviously fighting for the next leadership of this country have both made it pretty clear that they're going to give the devolved countries a bit of a kicking and they're not happy with them and they're going to put them in their place. Okay, so I don't know what the panel think of that. And the other thing that really, and it's, it's nothing new, it's always struck me, whether it be BBC News, general media, STV News, ITV News. Northern Ireland seem to always get missed out. The, the, the term Northern Ireland never comes into it. When the news headline comes up, it's always, oh, England, Scotland, Wales. <laughs> and I think, sorry, I, I mean, I'm, I'm missing something here, but Northern Ireland does exist. And they always seem to get missed out. I, I, I don't know the reasoning behind that. If we're all one, if we're all a union, where the hell's Northern Ireland? Bearing in mind that a lot of people in Northern Ireland do actually like the union for some strange reason. <laughs> <laughs> so am I missing something? Is it me or? Thank you. I'm pleased to say Lisa's not been missed out tonight. So we'll come to Lisa next. But the gentleman um, just by the speaker there, please. Hi, thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yeah. My name is Lucanio. I heard somebody, there was somebody there from New Zealand, so I must, I must, I might as well mention that I'm from South Africa, so nationalism goes in many ways. Fantastic. And, well, welcome from South Africa. It is New Zealand. I think we do much better than rugby at the moment, so I'm, so, so, so I'm feeling quite competitive for once, for, for, for the first time in a long time. <laughs> I was going to ask a question, actually, for, first for Michael. I think it's, I think it's actually been covered already, what, what you said about you know, the unions, all, I mean, sorry, unionists almost be, being the sort of biggest enemies of the union. And I think the gentleman sort of asked a similar kind of question. Based on what you've been hearing from the unionists fighting for the Tory leadership, I mean, is there any way they can turn that around, or do you think it's inevitable that it only goes one way? 
based on the rhetoric that we're hearing. But secondly, I, want to, I just had a specific question for Nicola, because Nicola you talked about the devolution issue and the, the way this viewed as someone's competition. What I was actually interested in terms of like, in terms of everyday life, I suppose, in like in, um, I'm interested in the role, what do you think of the role of the Scottish office, Scotland office? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it seems to be quite um, more active than I, than I remember in terms of like, you know, it's got specific projects in Scotland and it, it seems to do like, takes pride in sort of funding things directly, not going through the SNP government, as they call it. So I mean, in terms of the impact in that, is it good for unionism? Does it win hearts and minds in Scotland, or does it annoy people even more? <laughs> thank you. Um, Lisa, do you want to kick us off on another line of question? Great, yeah, thank you for the question. Um, I notice that too, quite often. Uh, so I, I do think that there is a tendency um, to blind spot Northern Ireland quite often in discussions um, about policy and politics. There's several reasons for that. I would say, again, um, as we've discussed, it tends to be different um, because of its different history, um, because of the different govern governing setup. Um, there tends to be less data available. So very often, if you look at surveys that are being carried out on British, for example, the British Social Attitude Survey is Great Britain, not Northern Ireland. Um, so there is a kind of an inherent difference written in. And part of that does go back to a, quite a long history. Northern Ireland was the first experiment in devolution from 1920 up to 72 and were thereabouts. And, and so the, the organisation of the civil service has more of a legacy in Northern Ireland. Um, but it is also the case that politically, uh, the Conservatives, Labour, SIP don't run in, ah, that's, apologies, the Conservative Party do run, they, they don't get seats. Um, <laughs> yeah, awkward. <laughs> um, so, but, so, so politically, it's, it's a different place as well, and a different picture. So to include Northern Ireland adds words to the article. Um, that's problematic. I don't, I'm not excusing that, um, but just recognising, I think that's um, often a, a dynamic that plays in. But again, back to the kind of original point, there is, there is more complexity within the UK state broadly than is, I think, um, normally recognised and discussed and perhaps drawing out the differences and the, um, the Northern Irish um, exceptional uh, quality allows us also to look at how the, there's diversity within England, there's differences. So I, I think that conversation generally could be helpfully broadened, including incorporating Northern Ireland more. Um, on the unionism, just to, well, perhaps actually I'll let Michael um, pick up on the, um, or the others talk to the two candidates for Prime Minister. Um, I may say too much. <laughs> <laughs> Michael. Thanks, Lisa. <laughs> uh, yes, I think this guy, I think this your question as well, was it, about the leadership of candidates? Yeah. Every Conservative leader since Edward Heath has discovered Scotland, previous Conservative leader had a more instinctive understanding of Scotland. Douglas Hume was Scottish. Macmillan claimed that he was the grandson of a, of a croft or he's a bit of a stretched argument, but at least he, I mean, he had this Scottish dimension to him and he went up to the Grouse Moors on the 12th of August every year. I mean, there's, you can laugh at that, but it was, just, it was a way of being Scottish about the, the old aristocracy. And the Conservatives have a very substantial presence on the ground in Scotland. They weren't even called Conservatives. They were called the Unionists, a distinct party. There was a distinct centre-right party in Scotland. They're no longer is and so leaders then don't have an instinctive understanding. The Labour Party is getting into that position now as well. They don't have people on the ground to tell them what to do in Scotland. Conservatives have long had that. Uh, and then they go through a process of, of, of learning. With Heath, he said, let's have devolution, run your own affairs. And his, Scottish, his own Scottish party said, no way, and that collapsed. And then Margaret Thatcher came in, uh, and there's a wonderful line, a book, book by uh, David Torrance, one about Thatcherism in Scotland. And Thatcher comes to Scotland and said, you in Scotland. And the Secretary of State for Scotland, Malcolm Rifkin, said, you can't say you in Scotland. It's as though you're in a foreign country. Okay. okay. So next time she said, we in Scotland. <laughs> it's not that either. You know, it's, that's, that's, that's just, you know. And then she gave a sermon on the mound in which she said, you know, Adam Smith was some kind of proto-Thatcherite, which is ludicrous to anybody who knows about Smith. So the, this, this desperately, and, and John Major worried about it senselessly, came up and, and, and agonised about uh, 
uh, the Union, and then Cameron thought that he'd solve it with a referendum. So there's a history there. Neither of these candidates, I can see, has learnt Scotland yet, or has even made any effort to, because the election campaign will be won and lost in, in England. They will. Whichever becomes, we'll discover. I know Liz Press spent a little bit of time in, 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 in Paisley, uh, but I mean, that, 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 that was a long time ago. She doesn't have that understanding of Scotland, just it, it, it seems to me. And then, what about the strategies? Well, the strategies Conservative government have been uh, pursuing is a mixture of um, no to referendum, uh, putting them in their place, and love bombing, which is the spending money. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm told constantly, you talk to them, oh, we, do, do you know we spent money refurbishing Perth City Hall? <laughs> now, why is that the business of anybody outside the city of Perth? <laughs> Even in Edinburgh, I don't know. <laughs> but that's it, now, we're bringing goods, and there's that big office down there in New Waverley, with the biggest union flag I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> <laughs> Looking over the ravine at St Andrew's House, and this is supposed to represent we're in government in Scotland. Or you could say it looks like the Governor General's residence. Mm -hmm. you, know, you, could, you could read that different ways, but somebody, I don't know whether they deliberately had that symbolism, but it could, be, it could go either way. And similarly, spending little bits of money, and they got that from Canada because I was in the Privy Council office in Quebec a few years ago, and they said we had these British civil servants came to talk with us. And what we did after the Quebec referendum, we put union uh, maple leaf flags all over the place. A very similar thing. Mm. Uh, I'm, I'm, this is a whole mixture of different strategies. Uh, what are they going to do about the Constitution? The Conservatives, nothing, I think, <coughs> at all. Mm -hmm. And m maybe they're right politically because conceding more powers has not affected support for independence mm -hmm. at all. Um, maybe a big move on sovereignty, because there are some Conservatives, a very much minority, who are saying, let's make a big offer on sovereignty. Let's say Westminster cannot legislate in devolved matters, period. No ifs and no buts. Now, there are some people saying that, and it would, it would take a Conservative government, I think, to make that big leap of faith and just say, do it. It probably won't happen. It almost certainly won't happen. Um, that's the question of, 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 of sovereignty. But other than that, I can't see much thinking going on in, in Westminster. Finally, on the question of uh, Westminster, the, the, the voice of the devolved in, in, uh, in, in Westminster, Westminster understanding of the devolved. This is another of my little anecdotes, but back in 1976, <laughs> uh, I was asked to teach a course on devolution in the Civil Service College, and I taught it till 1979, when for reasons that those of us who are old enough to remember no, <laughs> it was closed down. And when devolution actually happened, we didn't have this at all. But every few years I'm invited down, Nicholas comes down as well, and we go down to talk about devolution, and they give me a big lanyard, devolution matters, and a big mug saying, remember devolution. <laughs> uh, and when, I, when I'd done my lecture, they said, you can keep the mug. I said, no, you keep the mug, because... <laughs> 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 Now, this is not malevolence, it's just forgetting about the divorce. Mm. Devolved and, and, and forget. And I don't know whether in Scotland it's worse than they remember or worse when they forget about us. Mm. But there's just not that learning about we live in a federal kind of system here. Mm. Because it's so small, concerned with the big preoccupations of Whitehall. That, that's, that's really problematic. And it can only be resolved by a change in attitudes, I think. You can tinker around with the institutions, but the attitudes really have to think. And that federal conception of how the system works is still very weakly embedded in Whitehall. I should say some departments are better than others. There's, there's variation. But generally speaking, it's not been embedded in Whitehall thinking. Yeah, just to pick up on that, it's, it's one of the things that's come through really clearly in um, the research I'm doing on intergovernmental relations is that a lot of the challenge for devolved governments trying to engage with the UK government is churn. So Whitehall seems to have a difficulty in retaining staff. You know, so people go in, they're very young, they spend a few years, they move on. Um, and so they have to start again. So, you know, you feel like you're, you're trying to get your counterparts to understand devolution and then they disappear and then you have to start all over again. Um, and of course that work should be done within Whitehall itself. Um, some souls do try, um, but it's, it's a constant challenge, I think, to, to, to get that embedded understanding of devolution. Um, I wanted to pick up on something that Lisa said earlier about um, the, the whole sort of Brexit process and um, being a learning exercise in learning about what the UK is and all its complexity. 
not seeing a whole lot of evidence of the learning in the, co in the context of, of the, the election um, contest that we are seeing. And one can only hope that that is because they are competing for the votes of the party members mm -hmm. and that in the post of, in the office of Prime Minister, maybe, maybe there will be um, a different, a different attitude and a different um, perspective. Who knows? Who knows? Um, you were asking about the role of the Scotland office and you're right, I agree with you. I think it has, it has changed, it has become more active and actually it's no longer it seems to call itself the Scotland office. I think it's UK government, UK, in Scotland. UK government in Scotland or the Office of the Secretary of State for Scotland yeah. too um, on, the, on, on the website. But there's certainly a more active role and I will talk at length about UK Internal Market Act, but an element of that act was um, spending power. So the, through that legislation, the UK government gave itself the power to spend in devolved areas directly, so bypassing the normal routes of financing um, devolved matters and um, going through the, the, the devolved governments. So now they can go directly um, in a whole swathe of, of, um, of um, devolved areas. And as Michael said, that was straight out of the Canadian Playbook, very controversial uh, in countries where this is used. A colleague of ours now uh, passed away, sadly, used to call this boutique politics. Um, it's not, I don't think it's going to work. I mean, apart from anything else, we're talking about quite small sums of money. And there are, uh, you know, you talked about Perth City Hall. Um, I can talk about a roundabout in Falkirk. <laughs> which was um, on the list of things that received levelling up. Now, I live in Falkirk. Um, it will be very useful uh, to have that change, but will it make the people of Falkirk believe in the union more than they currently do? I, I, very, much, I very much doubt it. So if that is part of the rationale to, uh, to, to strengthen the appeal and image of the United Kingdom in all parts of it by um, spending in these areas, um, then I, I don't think it's going to make a whole lot of difference. And if that was going to make more difference, perhaps we wouldn't have had Brexit. Mm -hmm. If I may just mm -hmm. quickly, and um, you're absolutely right, perhaps opportunity to learn might yes. have been more accurate. Um, but just on that, uh, the, the question of boutique um, unionism and kind of unionist branding, the ability to spend, and this UK government does seem to be um, has very strongly emphasised to, to highlight how it's spending money and um, that sort of thing. In the Northern Ireland context, that in itself reveals just how tone deaf um, the government are and the misunderstanding. And there have been instances of, for example, in the post-Brexit context, wanting to um, all UK cars have GB stickers on them um, and ought to have. If you live in West Belfast or you live in Derry, not London Derry, you, you do not want a GB sticker on your car, <laughs> and you won't buy a car. I mean, it's just like, and if the, the government is going to spend and it wants a union jack, you know, we are investing in this area. Again, it's just, I mean, I'm, it is kind of funny because it's, it's so detached from reality, but it's also real. And it's also like, the tensions are high in Northern Ireland. Mm -hmm. We don't have a government. And the, some of the narratives um, really have been polarizing existing minority communities um, or minorities that uh, the double minority communities um, so so on one level it's it's kind of it's frustrating to watch and it can be a bit um, comic at times but but it is also that you have to do better there's an opportunity to learn and you have to do better yeah that's my Gosh, next set of questions, please. Oh, there's two together at the back. If we could take those in quick succession, that'd be marvellous. Hi. Um, I'm, I'm currently researching amongst pro-independence um, activists, like kind of a sovereignty study, and something I've, I'm Dutch, so something I've really noticed is that there's kind of a self-proclaimed civic nationalism here. Like, nationalists really present themselves as civic and, and inclusive. Whereas I kind of, whereas at the same time I notice a very strong anti-England sentiment. 
So I kind of wonder if you guys have any reflections on that, kind of how both can coexist within the same discourse. Thank you. And the question just behind. Thank you. Esther Robertson here. I was involved in the campaign to secure the parliament here um, as part of the Constitutional Convention and was always asked about the slippery slope to independence. And I used to say, no, 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 absolutely not. We'll get our parliament and it's fine. And I don't believe we need independence, but if we decide we want it, I'm a Democrat and I'm no feared. By the time we got to 2014, I was surprised to discover that I'd changed my mind. Only just, and I voted yes in 2014 to independence. If I hadn't, I certainly would the next time because of Brexit. And I've come to a view, and I'd, I'd be curious to hear what the panel thinks, because I've come to a view that, especially because of the demographics, um, my, our son's generation, who are in their 20s, the vast majority are in favour of independence. I think Scotland will become an independent country. Question is when. I suspect, but I couldn't begin to form an informed opinion, there is a possibility we'll see a united Ireland. And we've now begun to see the campaign for independence in Wales, albeit at a very low level. But I have always taken the view that we will end up back at the table with England because we are islands and we will share those islands and they will still be our friends and neighbours, and that what we're rejecting, and I'm disappointed you're picking up that ethnic anti-English sentiment, because I hoped we'd move beyond that, but I thought we were treating English as friends and neighbours, and our rejection was of Westminster and the system, not of the English. So I'd be curious to know, and in a way I'm told that's confederalism, because we will decide to share things, but we will decide what we're willing to share, rather than be told. Wow. Um. Well, uh, two more controversial questions. Um, how, how, who wants to go first? Michael. Yeah, can I, can I take this civic nationalism thing? Because I have some responsibility for introducing this in the Scottish debate about 30 years ago. <clears throat> it, uh, this is a controversial notion about what you mean by ethnicity, what you mean by nationalism, what is the nation, uh, and so on. <clears throat> and when I use that term in a book about Scotland, Wales, and Catalonia, what I was trying to point out is there are different ways of defining who belongs to the nation. Now, who is doing the defining? The citizens, the political movements, the official rhetoric, whatever. These are all at various different levels. But in the case of uh, Scotland and uh, Catalonia, Quebec's more complicated, there was a tendency for the nationalist movement to try and embrace everybody resident on the territory because it's the only way they were ever going to win a majority. Uh, and so in the case of Catalonia, you had, you're expected to learn Catalan, but if you come from the rest of Spain, it's not difficult. I've never learned Catalan, but I can understand it because I speak Spanish. In the case of Scotland, the cultural barriers are not that great because they are there. I mean, they exist, but they're not there because there's no language question. Uh, so that was, that's, that's the project. Then you talk to Scots themselves about who counts as being Scottish, and David McCrone and Frank Beckhoffer have done, worked on this for many, many years. And they say, well, people have different ways of being Scottish. Uh, how inclusive is being Scottish? For some people, you have to have a Scottish parent. For some people, you have to be born in Scotland. For some people, you have to live in Scotland. For some people, it's just enough wishing to be Scottish. Uh, and, uh, yeah, well, I mean, Rod Stewart or Alistair Campbell, people like that. You know, Scott. <laughs> well, why not? Why not? I mean, these are just different ways. So you, don't, you don't have to have rules about this. Uh, you, and and, and, and that this is a complex, and, but there's no one of those ones that trumps out all the others. So it's always a combination. And that works. That's, that's, that's how it works. And the other thing about Scotland is that the land boundary has not been changed since the 13th century. And so it's easy to say, look, there's a land boundary, anybody within it, which is the current voting system, by the way. You don't even have to be a citizen. That's, that's a civic notion. But on the other hand, we know that there are instances of people who get prejudiced and get silly ideas about people who are from England or, or elsewhere. There's racism in Scotland. Absolutely futile to deny it. So this is a very, very complex uh, question, but nations are built in, in, in different ways. And one of the things that, that Scotland can, I think, take some pride in is that uh, most conceptions of the who is Scottish are, uh, tend to be more, more, more inclusive than they are in many, many other places. I'll just put it like that. Quebec similarly has been moving in that direction. It used to be very strictly the, the Quebecois de Souche, the old uh, uh, 
type Quebecois. Um, and then it was actually the pro-independence movement who said, no, no, we want to be more inclusive uh, uh, than that, uh, because otherwise we'll never get independence unless we uh, convince the Anglophones to join our project. And there's some evidence in Scotland, it's actually the nationalists who have a more extensive, inclusive definition of who is Scottish than the Unionists do. Uh, because, they don't, because if you've got a territorial criteria, you don't need the ethnic one. So that's, that's the tendency, and I don't want to exaggerate, but in those movements I saw this construction of a civic nation, but let's not idealize it and say everybody's exclusive and nobody's prejudiced. It's not true. There are exclusions, there are divisions. Uh, so it's just about the nature of that project. And we've got a lot of data now that uh, seem to bear this out. Hmm. Yeah, just on the, on the um, <clears throat> support for independence, I mean, I think it's important to acknowledge that Scotland is split. And if you look at every opinion poll sin, uh, published this year, um, the split is either 50-50 or a marginal um, majority against independence. Um, so we are very far from a settled will. Um, that was the phrase that was used ahead of the devolution referendum when there was a settled will a perceived settled will that there would be um, a Scottish Parliament. Um, and I think for the nationalism, for the independence movement, I know the term nationalism, I have no problem with it, but some people do. Um, for the independence movement, the challenge is to build support. Um, you mentioned um, young people, and there's, it's quite clear that the, the biggest difference in terms of support for independence is age, in that those who are, I think it's 55 and over, are the ones who are quite clearly opposed to independence um, and um, the, the rest uh, not. Uh, but geography matters too. Um, and we talked about the geography of Brexit being a problem. I think if, the, if there was to be an independence referendum, um, you may find that there are significant parts of Scotland who feel that their voice is not reflected in a, a fundamental constitutional change. So I think there are clear challenges um, for the independence movement if they are, want to build a, con, a, a sense of consensus for um, a, a significant change. Um, I agree with you that um, even under independence there would have to be ways to work together on these islands. If you imagine COVID, if Scotland were independent, I expect there would have been the same meetings um, between the governments because some challenges, whether it's COVID or pandemic or climate change, some challenges defy constitutional boundaries. Um, so there would have to be ways to work together. But Brexit does complicate that. The vision of independence that was presented in 2014 um, some people coined it independence light because there was this idea of continued shared governance in a whole range of ways. Some of that is much more problematic when the UK is outside of the European Union and assuming that an independent Scotland would seek to rejoin. So there are definitely challenges there um, and I haven't seen any thinking on that yet in the papers that have been published by the Scottish Government uh, so far. Um, but I suppose the biggest challenge um, is what is the path? What would be the path to the independence referendum? And if the Supreme Court says the referendum bill is either, um, <coughs> either it says it now or further down the line says that it's beyond the powers of the Scottish Parliament, what then? And I think there is a, 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 a challenge um, for um, the SNP in particular um, to try to say, well, winning an election, winning a Westminster election would be a mandate for negotiating, negotiating independence. No, it wouldn't. One, because you still have the same problem in terms of securing over 50% of the vote, um, which may happen, but is far less likely in the context of an election. And two, negotiations require a willing partner. So I don't see the scenario where a UK government that refused 
to grant the powers to have a referendum would suddenly say, OK, you won guys north of the border in this UK-wide election. We'll accept that and come to the table. I just don't see that um, being the case. So there is a problem um, in terms of the pathway and the process um, of how you get to a referendum, let alone how you get to independence. But there is also a problem of the substance. It's not ins an insurmountable problem, the substance stuff, about what independence would mean in the context of Brexit, but it definitely creates new challenges, um, not least around the border, um, that would have to be addressed. Anything to add, Lee? So shall I go to the next two questions? In, uh, I can address the Ireland um, go quick question. We're, we're in the last 10 minutes. So last 10 minutes, OK. Um, <laughs> 10 minutes on the RCM. Um, so <laughs> the... At present, trends suggest we haven't mentioned um, this much, but in terms of the prospect of Irish unification, um, trends in Northern Ireland suggest that the, there has been moderate mm, um, the expectation that there will be unification in future has increased across all um, communities, unions, nationalist or neither. Um, the, desire to vote in favour has slightly increased in the nationalist and neither groups, not slightly, has considerably increased in the nationalist and neither and has very slightly increased in unionist but as has the desire to vote against, so it's a stronger trend in that direction. Um, but the expectation isn't that it'll be soon. Um, for the, the process question, um, is very important in terms of Irish unification and the, the realisation of that um, for those who pursue it because it all rests on a discretionary power held by the Secretary of State for Northern Ireland and the criteria around which um, he or she could decide to hold a referendum is quite ambiguous. It is um, that it appears to them that a majority would support, um, uh, would vote in favour of unification in Northern Ireland um, and there's lots of discussions around what that could look like and um, the different factors would be brought in. Um, electoral politics would be um, very likely considered and political polling, this is why polling is so um, often carried out, I think, in Northern Ireland. But also it would be a double vote. So the um, Republic of Ireland, Ireland would also hold a vote and there would have to be a double majority there. And it's um, worth recognising in terms of the, the trends that are currently evident. Sinn Féin are polling very strongly in um, southern, in Ireland, in southern Ireland, in whatever your term of choice. Um, <laughs> they have consistently been uh, the, the largest party. And if at the next election, if that, hold, that trend holds, um, they could be returned for the first time as the largest party and end up as a party of government. Um, it's perhaps worth saying that their most prominent um, issue is not constitutional change, um, it is cost of living change um, and civic nationalism is quite interesting in how Sinn Féin as a party on both sides of the border in Ireland, perhaps a comparative case study, um, are, are talking about um, inclusive vision of a changed Ireland in their language, a new Ireland. Um, all of that is to say that the trends currently evident suggest that you could end up at a united Ireland in the future, um, but nothing's inevitable. And it's worth saying that a lot of those trends have been, I think, are better categorised as push rather than pull. Um, so the, the line between the impact of Brexit is very clear in the data, um, as is the, uh, the Sinn Féin rise is vis-à-vis -vis the establishment parties that have been um, in and out of power for the whole time. Uh, so that's lots more to be said. I'll stop there. Fantastic. Right. We've just got time for two more questions. So two right at the front here, please. If we can take them short and in quick succession, that would be marvellous. And we can just squeeze them in. So quick with the microphone, uh, these, this gentleman here and this lady uh, over here. <laughs> that, that gentleman there. Thank you. Uh, politics is a dynamic game, dynamic business. So again, uh, Nicola, you're talking about 
uh, maybe people in Scotland, maybe a majority in Scotland, voting for independence going forward, or 50, well, 53, 53 seats to the SNP at the next general election. So therefore, again, it falls back on, well, what's democracy here? Or how do you define democracy? Or just because Westminster's going to control things that basically you're just going to be ignored then for the next 10 years again, doesn't really matter what you vote for. Thank you. And then over to the lady in the green, please. This reverts to Michael's earlier remark about politicians not get it, getting Scotland. Um, it's almost a, a one-choice word. Is that obduracy, arrogance, or indifference to the civic voice? And will that change come the difficult challenges of the cost of living increase and utilities cost increase? Thank you. And so we'll add those two questions. And because we're short on time, I'll ask you to add any final thoughts you want to add in. Which order do we want to take them in? Shall I work in the opposite order to what we started with and go to Lisa first and then back and finish um, my job? I think I have the least to say in response to those, <laughs> those um, really excellent questions. Um, is it obturant? Mm. Do you want the final word while you think yes, about please. it? And I'll pass to Nicola. I apologise. Yeah, um, what is democracy question. Um, I mean, it is interesting because in the, at the root of the word is the idea of a demos, and a demos is a people, but that's problematic in the UK context when you have complex multiple identities. Um, and if you think about the 18 years of conservative rule that preceded the devolution referendum, there was this sense that democracy was not working for Scotland. There was a sense that there was a deficit within the system and devolution was the means to try to address that. Um, I think if you had something persistently like that, that, that could could. I, I hate looking to the future. I don't like looking to next week, <laughs> never mind thinking about, you know, a, a decade from yeah. But again, back to uh, looking into the future. I know you're of academics. Uh, I don't know the derogatory way. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there's boys like uh, Jerry Hassan and another guy, Gunson, and they've produced a book where, again, Northern Ireland and Scotland are actually part of the EU, if you look at the front cover, mm -hmm. and they've put forward policies or ideas and things like that. Because then you're saying again, even don't want to use names, you're saying, well, polls show, well, what, apart from the academic guy, uh, what's his name? Uh, John Curtis, where you can say, well, he's an academic, he shouldn't be manipulating numbers or anything like that. It should be, you know, he takes that from the social, uh, Scottish social. As you say. Yeah. But if you're looking at YouGov or things that are in the Scots and the Times, uh, again, the sample size, the sample frame, what questions are they asking? Why are they selling that narrative? It's because they don't want change. Or there isn't going to be any change because you're manipulating mm -hmm. the actual democracy or lack of democracy within the UK. So, so I'm, I'm fairly confident I'm sure he that... No, no, so... so it, so the, the polling I was talking about is all the different polling firms, um, all using a variety of different sampling methods. And I'm fairly confident that it's re reasonably accurate to say that Scotland is split down the middle on the independence issue. Um, and today, and, and has been for a wee while, except, and, and, and this, I'll, I'll end on, on this. There was a period in, was it 2020? 2020, I can't remember, but there was about a six month period when support for independence was consistently in the majority. It ranged from about 51 to I think it got up to 58 in one poll. Um, and it was consistent in different polling companies between about June and Christmas of that year, precisely at the time when nobody was talking about independence. And why was that? I don't know for sure. But I think it was because the Scottish Government was seen to be governing COVID well. And so, um, it's not for me to tell the Scottish Government what to do, but if you are seen to be governing well, I think you inspire confidence 
in the project of self-government, whether that's devolution or whether it's independence. I'm, I'm going to have to stop you there. We're massively running out of time, and I don't want to hold everyone back. So, uh, uh, Lisa, any quick words for Henda Michael to finish? Um, just to perhaps say, uh, um, it's perhaps an uncomfortable reflection, but I do think there is there's a sense in which you're always in the state that you're in. And part of this conversation um, reminds me of conversations I've had in Northern Ireland with uh, unionist loyalist communities um, and actors who feel very strongly that they have been betrayed by the UK government, that they um, feel their British identity, their Britishness very strongly. And in explaining the, the realities of what has been decided on behalf of Northern Ireland and um, and been implemented, there is a, there's a sense in which you have to operate the system that you exist under is the system until it changes, which then comes to how do you change this, how do you get those the UK government to, to embrace change and transform. It's always going to be iterative and to an extent, I think, and perhaps this is cynical and it's a personal view, but um, it has to be to an extent in their interest to do so. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah, just picking up Anne's point there and, and about politicians' self interest, I think mm -hmm. if you looking at the attitudes of UK politicians in England, you've got to take into account public opinion in England mm -hmm. itself. And the extraordinary thing compared with Spain and Canada and other places I've looked at is how indifferent people in England are <laughs> to Scottish independence. Northern Ireland, Irish unity, they'd rather have it. Yeah, yeah. Go away. <laughs> go Just it. don't yeah. you, you, you don't interfere with our affairs or our parliament as they see Westminster. And that's a powerful sentiment that you've got to work against. On the other hand, in fact, uh, the surveys uh, about Brexit show that Brexit voters in England would rather Scotland and Northern Ireland left if that was the way to achieve Brexit. Mm. Extraordinary figure. Mm. On the other hand, no Conservative leader could lose <coughs> Scotland and survive. Mm. So they're caught there. They're caught between these two imperatives that are pushing in different directions. And I think that explains a lot of their tactics because they haven't got this deeper understanding of the Union. Mm. Or at least they catch up in it too late and then they're out of office. You look like you've got one Can more I say word. One more final thing. Um, I do think, in all of that, in terms of um, how that change comes and self interest, it comes back to the point about the inevitability of the relationships between peoples and authorities of these islands. So, however, it goes down <coughs> in terms of um, power plays or the politics or the legality of where we are and where we're going as a state or as a um, as a reformed uh, collection of um, polities, we're always going to have to relate to each other. So there's always going to be a cost benefit to um, how much trust or distrust, how much agreement or disagreement is, uh, occurs in the processes of change or stability, um, and then the aftermath of that in terms of how we relate together, because we are geography binds us. Well, what a, a sentence to end on. Um, if you would join me in thanking the panellists. Um, I, huge, huge apologies for overrunning by a couple of minutes, but thank you everyone for your questions. It's very much appreciated. I think the only thing that is certain for me from this discussion is we have lots and lots of food for thought here. But we've also got lots and lots of change, no matter what happens, because we know that some of the things that are going to happen, no one is in control of. Um, I think the role of the pub in the Brexit vote is really interesting. If you look at those communities, we, you know, we've, we've got lots of things to think about going forward. So, and some of them we've discussed today, and no doubt we could come back again next year and do it all again and discuss different things. So um, hopefully we'll see you again soon. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.